Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with the rather wonderful Mr. Fred Mandel. How are you? I'm doing okay, Warren. Thanks. This is, uh, this is exciting for me and I have to uh, control my, um, my fangirl side because of course... Me too. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, you did play with some rather incredible artists over the years, one of which would be Queen, of course. And anybody who's ever watched a, you know, an episode of anything I've done, I probably get to talk about Queen at least two or three times. Every yeah, time. they're, they're pretty popular. <laughs> yeah, a huge influence on me and so many other musicians. But I'd like to know a little bit more than just that. So you were born in Canada? Yeah, Estevan, Saskatchewan, Canada. A little mouthful there. I don't think you can get more Canadian than Saskatchewan. No, it's right in the middle. Estevan, Saskatchewan, Canada. It's 10 miles north of the American border. Um, the big American city is Minot. Uh, the big excitement was the uh, Air Force used to break the sound barrier over our house and our dishes would come flying out of the cupboard and scare the <laughs> shit out of my mother. Um, but it's a small prairie town, 5,000 people. You know, I was there until I was 11 years old and I uh, heard a lot of rock and roll on the radio when it started, you know, from the States and country and western and stuff. So it was kind of a uh, a mixing melting pot of, of music coming through that, that little town. But it was a great place to be born, you know, and run around the prairies and have fights with my friends. It was great. When did you first start playing uh, piano? I started uh, at four. Four, wow. And I started guitar at eight. But my dad had a friend, my dad was a played, a ridiculous story, but he used to play piano and he never really realized what he was playing. But he was, a, you know, he owned a store, but he also loved piano and blues and all that stuff. So. What was the store? Uh, Mandel's. <laughs> Mandel's? Yeah, it was a, a clothing store. You know, he had a little, a little clothing store in, in a small town. And uh, they had, you know, ladies and men's wear, and they had done groceries originally, but then they just branched into to, to clothes. And uh, he learned how to play this kind of blues-oriented piano style from a teacher in, in Estevan. And I never really realized what the connection He was British, a British guy. And he taught my dad some of the stuff, which was New Orleans piano, which, uh, you know, St. Louis Blues and a bunch of other things, and my dad used to play these songs, and it wasn't until years later that I realized he was playing New Orleans-style blues, and that was an influence on me. Um, That's great. That's a great way to start. So he was, you know, unfortunately, the, the piano teacher had a limp in one leg from some, an injury, and, the, and all the craziest thing happened, there was a riot in Estevan, of all places, the coal miners, and there was some shooting in the main street, and he got hit in his good leg. <laughs> which is, uh, anyway, that one was, was my dad's piano teacher, and uh, he sort of uh, transferred that. So your dad taught you piano, or did you just He didn't learn really by... teach me. He, he just played, and I started banging around myself. And my dad had a friend, um, a guy by the name of Mitchell Parks, who was a Canadian uh, piano player from Winnipeg, and he used to come visit. And he was a professional player for the CBC, and he had this program called Hymn Sing, and he used to play all the piano for it, but for years, he was a CBC, you know, session guy, and he, sho he showed me my first boogie run at six, and it took me until 12 till I had that rundown, and I showed it to him years later, when, he, when we were both a adults, well, he was an adult, I was still, but uh, it was pretty interesting, and I, I still work on that today, but I got the foundation for the blues and all that stuff from my dad and from Mitch, and That's from listening amazing. to the radio, and, and, and I'll, you know, when I was eight, I got a guitar, and uh, I tuned it to an open tuning and played like that for years and the Beatles came out. And when I was 12, I played with a guy who said, I, I, can't, I won't play with you because you play re weird. So I had to relearn guitar at 12 with standard tuning, which was, I'm glad that guy said that because then I learned how to play properly. But, you know, I had that foundation from Saskatchewan, so. So at 11, where did you move to? Toronto. Ah, so that's moved, yeah. definitely a bigger city. The big city. I'd never been on a bus like that. You know, I, I took I took a bus to school, and I went through Yorkville Village to cut through to school every morning, not realizing that that was such a historical musical place. You know, and like I was too young to go to the clubs, but Joni Mitchell was playing there, and uh, Neil Young was playing in a town uh, in the town. Um, Steppenwolf was in Toronto, came from Toronto, and there were a lot of bands that came out of there. Rick James and Neil Young were in a band together called the Minor Birds, believe it or not, which not a lot of people know. And all these things were happening. I was hearing it on radio, but I wasn't, you know, too young to go to the clubs. So when I got older, I started to associate with some of the people that knew these guys, you know, because my friend Don Trano took over from Robbie Robertson when they became Levon and the Hawks, and then became the band. So there was a connection there. I was, you know, influenced by a lot of the Toronto R&B scene. That's incredible. The Toronto music scene, even to this day, is incredible. There's a lot of great so players, great players up there. 
some of the best organ players I've ever heard are in Toronto, J just sitting around doing gigs, you know, weekly. And there was always an organ and a B3 in the clubs back then. But I was a piano player, and you know, and I had to learn how to play that eventually, you know. Um, You're probably in demand because everybody wanted to be a guitar player. There probably wasn't very many good guitar keyboard players. At least that's what it was like in England when I was a kid. Well, there were in Toronto. There, there were a lot of good B3 players, but it was all organ. I, I mm -hmm. never saw many. You know, I guess Richard Manuel was playing piano with Ro you know, with the Hawks, but um, everybody had a B3 in their band. And I ended up in Don Toronto's band with uh, my keyboard partner Dave Tyson, who was playing B3 and synth, and I would play clavinet, Rhodes, and, and synth. So we had a kind of partnership. We played... What synth in those days? Uh, a Korg Maxi Korg. Um, and it was a two... It played... It was a two-note synth. So Dave and I used to arrange four-note horn parts, you know. Da, da, and you See, could, polyphonic, two notes. Two notes, <laughs> yeah. And you could bend notes on it, so I treated it. I always thought guitar when I did solos, mm. which even translated the Wanna Break Free solo, which was guitar thought, if you think mm -hmm. about it. You know, it's all bending notes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we had, you know, a little, little synths back then. Um, and we just used uh, the f two of them to make one four-note chord. That's incredible. <laughs> kind of crazy. It doesn't seem that long ago, actually, when I think about it, late 70s, early 80s, when it was still a big deal, like, oh, my God, you've got a five-note polyphonic synth. I mean... <laughs> well, I got into this country on a visa yep. and got my green card as a synth specialist. Nice. Because I was running an Oberheim four-voice modular synthesizer when I was playing with Alice. And I had J.L. Cooper modify the two levers on it because I couldn't bend notes on it like I could on my maxi -corg. So I talked to J.L. Cooper, and he put in the little box that hung off the edge of this uh, Oberheim, and one was for uh, modulation, one was for bending, and I had my little, it was a big fat sound. And eventually they incorporated that design into the uh, Oberheims themselves, so they were sticking out of the, the, the construction of the box itself. But yeah, it was one of the first benders for that, uh, for that keyboard back then. I used to have to hit it with my shoe to keep it in tune, <laughs> because the four oscillators were not you know, they wouldn't stay. So let's get a little bit of uh, detail about um, Toronto to, yes, coming, coming to America to work with Alice Cooper. What was the sort of, what's the bit in between there? Well, I started, I worked with this guy called Grant Smith. I had a band called Grant Smith and the Power, and they'd had a hit with Keep On Running, Spencer Davis tune. Years later, I'd ended up playing with Spencer, played that tune with Spencer himself in the States here, but I worked with Grant Smith for about a year, and then I ended up in a band called Lighthouse, uh, which was a Canadian kind of Chicago horn band. They had a couple of hits in the States here. And then I went on to uh, work with Dominique Triano. And during that period of time, I was friends with um, Prakash John, who was a favorite, uh, famous kind of bass player who played with Lou Reed and, and Whitey and those guys. So um, when I worked with Donnie, we did a whole, uh, a whole year of touring and recording. We went to New York, did a record there with Capitol. And then... Um, I got called in by Don to come play uh, on Dick Wagner's record, who I hadn't met, but Bob Ezrin was producing Dick Wa Wagner in Toronto. So uh, Dave Tyson and I came in and was played. Was this a Frost record or? No, this was a solo record. Solo record. He'd yeah. already written Only Women Bleed, I believe, and some other stuff. He'd written some big hits for Alice. And this was his solo. Oh, OK. Um, so it's like mid, late 70s. Uh, yeah, 76, I 76. think. 76. No, 77. 77, OK. So we went in with, uh, with Bob Ezrin, and um, we cut that record. And during that period of time, uh, Dick liked my rock and roll piano playing and asked me if I'd be interested in, you know, playing with Alice Cooper. And so I went and told Dominique that I was, had this offer, and he said, yeah, sure, you, you should go do it. So I left, uh, I, got, uh, I left in May 20th, 77, I think it was, and came down to L.A., and that's when I started playing with Alice down here. Marvelous. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. What was the, now, that was like Alice's first or second solo record, Welcome to My Nightmare? Uh, Welcome to My Nightmare. It would have been, it would have been the Nightmare Band right after that. Right yeah. after that. Okay. I think Nightmare came out in '75 or something, and okay. this was '77. Okay. So we did a live album called uh, the Alice Cooper Show. That was uh, that band, and then Alice did a record with David Foster, '78 or something, which I played one track on. I was not a session player then, 
I did, couldn't read charts, and David put this chart in front of me. He might as well turn it upside down because I was not a good session player. I hadn't, I'd only done one record. But I'd always done records with bands, so they were my parts and stuff. I didn't have to sure. read anything. I was part of the band. So did you have to do a crash course in reading? I, I, I kind of had to figure out some stuff. But I usually ended up in bands where they were my parts. You know, with Elton, I had the freedom to put together the parts that I wanted. So I was never really reading anybody else's stuff after that. I, I never considered myself a session player. It's only recently, in the, you know, that I, in the past 10, 20 years, that I did a lot of sessions for other people where I'd make charts and stuff. But, but I was never, uh, you know, an A-call session player. I was mostly a touring musician who did sessions with the bands that I toured with. You know, with uh, Elton, I did five records with him, and uh, maybe six, actually. And then Queen, you know, uh, with the, the Queen record and two, you know, solo projects, which were uh, Brian and Freddie, you know, so... Um, but through all that period of time, uh, I just came down here and started working with Alice. I played keyboards for about three years with Alice, and then um, the band changed. In 78, Dick was not there anymore, and Steve was not there, and so I ended up the, the, the de facto musical director, and we got these two guys from a big guy named Elton John's band, D. Murray and Davy Johnstone joined Alice's band. So that's where we became friends, and we toured for a while and became really good friends. And um, that's how I eventually ended up in Elton's band. Oh, because they went back to play with Elton? They went back to play with Elton. And you and, came with them? And No, I didn't come with them. <laughs> I, uh, Davey and I and Alice wrote some stuff for a record in about 79, and uh, I switched to guitar on that tour because Davey left, and there were, it was myself and another guitar player, Mike Panera. So uh, I had written a lot of stuff on guitar, so I decided just to go on guitar and play lead guitar for us. It seemed like fun, and it was. And plus, you were able to dodge bottles. It's a lot easier when you're on a guitar than you were on a, <laughs> sitting at a keyboard. A guy threw a hockey puck at me. I'm like, you know, how do you dodge a hockey puck in the dark? <laughs> I turned around. This thing was rolling around on the ground beside me. But yeah, that was a whole other thing. What what happened to us on stage? We were tear gassed. There were riots. There was a sniper. This was a which band? This was Alice. Alice. Yeah. Yeah. It took me years to start to start uh, you know stop scanning the audience with him. So I, I spent a year uh, on guitar, and then I wrote some stuff. And Roy Baker. Roy Thomas, well, Todd Rundgren was going to do it, and he produced a couple songs for us. But then we ended up going with Roy Thomas Baker, and he did the whole record with us. And I became friends with Roy. And I think that may have been my connection to Queen, because Roger Powell was playing a couple things. We did a couple of merge. Was Elton before Queen? No. I oh, did okay. Queen. Queen I joined in 82. Okay. Played with them. Did an American tour and a Japanese tour, where they were unbelievably famous. You know, and they, we got out of the airport, and we had to start running. And Brian said, you know, run this way. And I jumped in the car with him and people were, girls were screaming, you know, it was crazy. Then I ended up doing Brian's solo project with Eddie Van Halen. Um, it was Eddie Van Halen, Phil Chen from Rod Stewart's band and Jeff Beck's Blow by Blow, I think. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal. Uh, Phil on bass and then Alan Gratzer from uh, REO Speedwagon and myself, and which kind of a blues record with some, you know, Starfleet kind of uh, theme things from the British uh, TV show. And then uh, the Queen took a year off, so I, I ended up touring with Supertramp for a year. And Amazing. I out, yeah, I went out with them, and uh, that was a lot of fun. We were additional musicians, Scott Page and myself, and we toured... Uh, I know Scott. I haven't seen him in years. Yeah. The sax player. Sax, Scott right, yeah. Yeah, who and played I was, with Pink Floyd. Right. And I was running all over the stage. Sometimes I'd play piano, then I'd come running back, and I'd go back to Rick's organ, and then I was playing... And I was doing some guitar stuff on that, too. But that was a great tour, and I uh, had a lot of fun with those guys, and they used to, like... To jam afterwards, so we would do the set, and we'd go jam at a club afterwards because they were really an R&B band. It was great playing with them. I remember we were playing in Austin one night, and I turned around. There's Willie Nelson standing beside me while we were jamming on stage. It was great. So we had a jam with New Willie and, and his harp player. But so I did um, '83 with uh, Supertramp, and then '84 I got the uh, call to come play with uh, with um, Elton, and I had auditioned for Foreigner and got the gig because they were just in the middle of the I want to know what love is uh, period. So I went to New York and I did an audition with them. And I, I got that gig, but I had a, I, I wanted to continue with Elton because I, I didn't realize that I was going to be asked to do the first record. And I, I had to check with them, and it turned out I was they wanted me to do it. So that kind of set me going with Elton. And uh, I was with Elton from 84 to 90, I think. Five, I guess it was seven years altogether. But the connection that brought me to the States really was Dick Wagner. He started the whole bow rolling because Dick wa hired me to do the, uh, you, know, you know, his record and then to do the Alice tour. And that really uh, was my ticket into the United States. 
and you know, I became an American citizen just a couple oh. of years ago. Yeah, so I'm Incredible. dual now. Yeah, so it opened up a lot of things for me. So I'm thankful to Dick for opening that path. Dick is a or was um, unfortunately he died a couple of years ago. He was a mutual friend of ours and um, right. Huge fan of his. I grew up on his records. We we're talking about rock and roll, Animal <laughs> earlier, and of course all the stuff he did with Aerosmith and Kiss as a session player. He was second to none, and he was. Him and Steve Hunter were Bob Ezrin's kind of first call, and Jack Douglas's first call on pretty much any record. That's right. They were kind of a dual, dual dueling guitar uh, team, and that's the band I joined when I was with Alice to begin with. And they were great. Those guys were really great guitar players. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot from Dick, and he was a great writer. I mean, he wrote so many hits for Alice. Uh, Only Women Bleed, You and I, I Never Cry, a bunch of stuff, and some stuff on the... the um, from the inside record with uh, David Foster producing. Uh, Dick wrote a lot of that stuff. And th then I think Alice was writing with Bernie Toppin, which was another connection too. It's kind of funny because Alice lived in the hills, up in Beverly Hills, and Elton lived next door apparently. I didn't know this. <laughs> but Alice used to say, yeah, I like to go next door and borrow a cup of diamonds. And uh, actually we did go next door once and I did meet Elton. He was wandering around the house in a sombrero and Davey was playing guitar. So we brought us, we went next door and met Elton. But I didn't really know Elton by the time, you know, I knew everybody else in the band by the time I joined Elton's band. So it was kind of, all these things were intermingling, you know, uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s. So it was an interesting scene and that's how I ended up in, the, in Elton's band, I think. Did you, uh, did you get to play in South America with Queen? I never did South America with them because they took a year off after oh, we did. They took a year off and I ended up with Supertramp and then I ended up with Elton. So. When I was El with Elton, I was still working with Freddie Mercury because I was in London doing some stuff with Elton and I had a break and I went down to do uh, the Mr. Bad Guy solo record in Munich with Mac and uh, Freddie. So, uh, How yeah. were those sessions? They were great. I mean, I saw that was portrayed in the movie that Freddie was depressed or something, but that wasn't the guy I knew in Munich. We were having a great time and he was, you know, went out, to, went out for dinner. I was having a good time and we were just working. It was work, you know, and... Um, we did a lot of, I have a, some, actually some takes of us uh, jamming together on this tune that we actually ended up, uh, I guess it was a co-write because it was a thing called She Blows Hot and Cold and I, there's, the two of us were just jamming in the studio which turned into this tune. But the other stuff, I did some overdubs on tunes that had already been, you know, um, recorded and uh, I think I played on, oh, quite a few things on that record. It was pretty quick, was, I'm only there for two or three days. Oh, that's, yeah. that's pretty crazy. It, well, yeah, it was not a long, uh, I think we did song after song. Fooling Around, I think that was one of the tunes we did. And uh, I can't remember all the names of the tunes, but uh, some of them were, you know, were kind of disco hits and stuff. It was a lot of fun. But uh, he had a good band together, and uh, I, think, uh, I think we got a lot of stuff done in a pretty short period of time. And Mac was producing the whole thing. Mac's great. He used to be in L.A., didn't he? Right. I hear he's back. He's back in Munich. Back in Munich. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to find an excuse to interview him at some point. Oh, you should, yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of stuff with Mac, and he's, I mean, he did all the Billy Squire records, uh, mm -hmm. The Stroke, and all that other stuff, and he did a lot of stuff. He worked with Black and Blue, he engineered, he did the Jeff Lynne stuff, uh, engineering, and he's, you know, that studio was, just, a lot of people came through that studio in Munich. So after Elton, what did you do? I took some time off. I did a little producing with... Uh, Rick Davies, which turned into a song that ended up on the next Supertramp record as a co-write, a co-production with Jack Douglas producing. Fantastic. So the, um, but I'd never met Jack. I'd already done my part, so they just you know, they just added some stuff to it. And then I sort of started trying to acclimatize myself. I didn't really want to go on the road again. I was trying to stay in town, and uh, it took me a long time to get back into the L.A. scene. And I started working on a variety of other things, and uh, oh, I did some stuff with Spencer. I went on the road with him a little bit, Spencer Davis. But uh, most of it I was just working locally. Then I met uh, Philip Sace, the guitar player, and I started doing some stuff with him. And I had been playing in a club and, uh, where I was playing bass for some guitar, bass sometimes, and keyboards, and you know. And I met Philip and I started doing some records with him and I met, through him, Dave Cobb and Jay Rustin, who are two producers I know, and um, did a lot of work with those guys. I did some work with Pearl, I worked with her for a while, who's, um, Meet Love's Daughter and uh, Married to Scott Ian. So through that, I did a couple Anthrax records where they covered Boston's tune, Smoking. I didn't know Pearl was Meat Love's Daughter. Yeah. 
But I, I, I know who she is, but I didn't realize that. It's so ridiculous because when we did this, we did a movie with Alice called The Roadie, with mm -hmm. Meatloaf as a star. And she was a little kid, at that, like one year old at that time, when we were shooting at the sports arena here. So we were in the same place together when we were, you know, when she was a little baby. You know, I, I did a lot of country stuff with Dave Cobb, and I did some stuff with Anthrax, and played one a couple live gigs with Anthrax. We did, uh, we covered that uh, Kansas tune, Carry On, Wayward Son. Yeah. So they like, <laughs> I played all the keyboards on that, and we actually did it live a couple times. I was expecting, you know, they never had a keyboard player, so I was expecting a bottle in the head or something, but they were very receptive. <laughs> with Dave Cobb, we started doing, you know, country records, and uh, I did rock stuff. Uh, do you find yourself traveling to Nashville to work with them? Or? I may do that at some point, but um, I did a lot of stuff. You know, I just did a Chris Stapleton uh, track here, which was an Elton tune that Elton had asked Chris to do. So once again, those connections are ridiculous. Which song was it? It was, a, it was a song called I Want Love. And um, I, I had already, I knew that song because I came back to rehearse with the band a couple times. I got called back to sort of sub for Elton. In 2003, they did a tribute to Elton at the, after the NAMM show at the Pond in uh, Anaheim. And so I was playing piano instead of Elton because he can't play for his own tribute, you know. So um, I played with Ray Charles and, uh, and Brian Wilson came up and did some stuff. And, That's incredible. Yeah, it was really cool. And then we went to London and did sort of the same type of thing as a benefit for the Old Vic Theater there. And uh, I think I played with uh, Courtney Love who was arrested on our flight. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's always great to see the pilot and the cabin crew go leaving the cockpit, running towards the back. And uh, <laughs> but apparently, you're not allowed to call the stewardess the c word. And uh, Courtney depend hadn't gotten that memo. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but I played with uh, I think Sinead O'Connor and some other people, and it was a lot of fun. Sting was there, and Elvis Costello. So you know, uh, I did that, and then I did a bunch of country records with Dave Cobb. One of which was Jamie Johnson's record, and that went to number one on the country charts. That was a number wonderful album. Four or five, yeah, the guitarist, guitar song. I was called in to play one song, and I ended up doing the whole record. And so uh, Dave had a lot of success with that record. And, um, you know, we did the Oak Ridge Boys and some other stuff, and uh, a couple of rock bands, and a lot of things in LA. And then Dave moved to Nashville. So then I started working on my own stuff and playing around town a little bit with Pearl. And Philip Sace, you know, I did a lot of stuff with Philip. And now I'm just sort of trying to get my own stuff together and go out and do some of my own things. That's incredible. Do you have a studio of your own that you work from? I have a little room, but it's not really a studio. I mean, I have my little setup, my Pro-X speakers and my little lunchbox and, you know, my all my keyboards. But I wouldn't call it a really... Like, a little interface? Uh, yeah, a little interface. And, uh, I mean, I did it... When I first did my first record, I didn't even have a proper interface. I had an M-Box, and I had Ian Wire... Uh, these special cords so I could bypass the, the preamps in that, I use my API preamps and get into the... Into this is the Ian of Trio Audio, yes. Yeah, Ian of Trio Audio, Ian yeah. Gardner, who's also a really good bass player. and uh, But uh, he helped me out with a lot of that stuff, and then I ended up mixing it, and now I'm just trying to do the minutia, which I hated in high school, which is the, basically the homework. You know, all the stuff that when you did before, it was taken care of. You know, you go on tour and it would be taken care of for you and the record would come out. Well, I didn't, I missed a step there, which now you have to do yourself. And uh, so I've been working on that. And um, I mixed and mastered and kind of ready. Is, is the album out? No, no, it's oh, okay. just it's just being, uh, have a So graphic. there is no link? Not, <laughs> not yet, no, no, not yet. I mean... Uh, well, let's, let us know. Are you singing on it as well? Yeah, I played everything on it except drums, played bass, guitar, keyboards, and all the other stuff, and did the vocals. And Dave Tyson produced vocals for me. And uh, Jay Rustin did the drum engineering. So I did everything at home, and then I took it into the... I did it out bath, backwards, you know. I did all my tra uh, tracks at home, and then I went into the studio, and we did drums in the studio. Which uh, studio did you use for the drums? Uh, Clear Lake, Clear Lake okay. in uh, Burbank. And Jay's been working out of Sphere lately, I think, but uh, I just finished um, Thin Lizzy record a little while ago. Uh, but it's actually Black Star Riders. But they go out as... as Black Star Riders sometimes, so it's an offshoot of the Thin Lizzy. Uh, who, who was playing in that band? Well, Scott Gorham, mm -hmm. and the, they've got a, a new singer. That, n nobody from the, it's a more modern band, but it's really... Uh, but Scott's in it. Yeah, Scott's in it, yeah. I know Tom Hamilton was playing bass on some of that. Oh, was he? Yeah, some of the live stuff, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Huh. No, uh, yeah, well, I just did this uh, a few months ago, 
and uh, I think that's coming out pretty soon. So I'm oh, like, fantastic. Yeah, it sounds great. I did the one before, and they had a real uh, hit with uh, Testify or Say Goodbye in, in England, I think, in Europe. Well, we're, we're going to have links to your, your discography, and people can go and yeah. listen to all the stuff you've recorded and worked on. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a link to my, uh, my Facebook, uh, which is, I think it's Fred Mandel Music. I'll get some more stuff out as soon as I get closer to releasing this and get the minutia done and all the things that you know that have to be done on the on the record itself. But I'm slowly moving forward on that. That's marvelous. Well, I mean, there were a lot of interesting stories that happened with uh, Alice. I mean, there was no shortage of uh, excitement with that band. Give it. Tell us some Alice Cooper stories. All right. Well, Dick was not in the band at this time. It was a, a little later band. Uh, I believe Davey was playing guitar. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but uh, we were playing St. Paul, Indianapolis. We were at, near the encore, and we used to do uh, Schools Out as the encore, and everybody would do a solo. And uh, there was about 12,000 people in this arena, and I was in the middle of doing my solo, and I saw one of the road crew kind of gesturing and yelling at me, and I thought, oh, you must be getting off on what I'm playing. <laughs> and then I played a little more, and all of a sudden the house lights went up, and the crowd was running. Like 11,000, 12,000 people were running. The, like the floor was just opening up. And I thought, yeah, I've played some bad solos, but nothing like this. Yeah. And uh, what had happened is a guy, uh, and I've said this before, to show his appreciation, had thrown a military tear gas canister on stage, which emptied out the whole auditorium. Which I, and we hadn't felt the effects, and what the road crew was trying to yell was, get off stage, you idiot. Yeah. Um, but I was still playing my solo, <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, a 12-foot cyclops on stage with a flashing light, he got hit, and he was on his, on the, on his face with his feet kicking, so it was kind of like a comedic horror story, and all of a sudden, I started feeling weird, and I thought, oh, wait a second, this is, and all of a sudden, the lights went up, and everybody started running, so, and then I felt this, the gas, and it inspires panic, it causes panic in you. Can you imagine? So we ran into the dressing room, and I thought, well, gas is going to come under the door here. I'm not going to stay in here. So I went running out, and there was a limo there, and I just jumped in it, and a, one of the dancers was on the floor coughing, and I said, get us out of here, and he drove out and drove us to the hotel. Alice apparently went running into the parking lot, jumped into a Mercedes Benz, and said, take me to the hotel, picked a nice car, and uh, that was just a t typical night with Alice. So, <laughs> uh, you know. I, sp I suppose in those days it was sort of, you know, he was, he was, you know, it was a horror theme and it, it just people were up in arms about his, you know, supposed satanic worship, which is funny, of course, because we all know that, that Alice is actually a Christian. Yeah, and he and wasn't. He doesn't even drink. No, he, he did then a little right. bit. A little, a little bit. bit, but now he's been sober for decades. For decades, and he was never into that anyway. He was, yeah. you know, he was a Hollywood guy. He was, was friends a, with Groucho Marx. He was hanging out, you know. It was a stage show. Yeah, it was, it was an a act. persona. Yeah, persona. Better, better description, yes. I saw the same kind of uh, persona with Lady Gaga, who refers to herself in the third person, you know. So, yeah, he had that figured out. And we did, you know, uh, we did concert, a concert that helped uh, restore the Hollywood, the O and the Hollywood sign and stuff. He, he was a Hollywood guy. And he knew really, well, he said to me once, I don't care what they say about me as long as they spell my name right. And I think, <laughs> I think that summed up a lot of, you know. Right. But it was uh, back in the days of all all publicity is good publicity. Absolutely, yeah. And well, I guess I don't think that's true anymore. No, <laughs> it's definitely not true. But the uh, you know you always want to play your hometown when you're in a successful band. And my first homecoming um, was with Alice, and I hadn't met Alice before I joined Alice. I met him when I was a 15 year old kid. I had written out, we went, my friend and I skipped out of school to go see him at a television station. My friend said, hey, Alice is playing, doing this thing, we should go down and see him. So they said, if you have any questions for Alice, you know, so I wrote it down on my hand, with my little pen, and when I met him, I was really nervous, and I said, uh, I understand you have a contraption that allows you to hang yourself. And uh, he said, cut your head, he said, yes, well, yes, Fred, I do. And, it was a weird thing, but you know, nine years later, I was in the band, so it was, <laughs> it was very strange. But uh, the Toronto homecoming, um, we got back to Toronto after a three-month we three-month bus tour, and uh, we were playing a pretty big place there, the Canadian National Exhibition. It's about eighteen to twenty thousand people, and 
it was packed and uh, it was an outdoor concert, you know. Um, I had like 35 friends there and my parents and I got a limo so I could take them down there. Uh, about an hour after the opening act, Alice had not shown up. And we heard he was sick, I don't know what, what happened to him, but he was, but someone made an announcement that indicated he was held up at customers, so there was an authority thing that people were pissed off. And I, I was using trainer amps in those days and I would brought the guys down to, to see my amplifiers and that's the first thing they started throwing chairs at. So when I, I didn't get changed that night into my stage stuff because I just felt something was wrong. And as time went on, all of a sudden we realized this was getting heavier and people were throwing chairs and it was starting to become a full scale riot. So I had to get my parents out of there and my 35 friends. And we got outside of the stadium and I thought, oh, this is gonna be a drag house, gonna show up and then we're gonna, I'm gonna miss this, my first hometown gig. And then the band went screaming by in their limousine with their faces all white. And then the helicopters were coming in and the police were uh, on horseback, and it was really a mess. It's on YouTube, but that was my first uh, hometown. That was your home country. Yeah. The riot. You, yeah. caused, you caused a riot in Toronto. A riot in Toronto. <laughs> in your hometown. Yeah, and that was my, uh, so those are a couple of, you know, typical days in Alice's band. It calmed down after that with every band I played with, you know, but, but uh, you know, after that, it was just a musical experience as I had with those guys. And with all great musically, especially with Elton, who was a childhood hero of mine, you know. I can imagine, yeah. And, uh, in a weird way, I, I know I sound like him in some ways, but I always related to Elton because he was the first guy that I heard with a heavy left hand. And when you're a kid by yourself, you're sort of accompanying yourself, but you're trying to play bass as well. And mm -hmm. I always went for a big piano sound. And his was the first recorded sound that I could relate to that I thought I sounded like or wanted to sound like. So we have similar uh, styles, I think, piano-wise. Uh, piano Years later, for my birthday in 1988, he gave me a piano, uh, a grand piano, a Steinway Grand. We had had it on the road with us, and he played it a little bit, and it was backstage, and it had developed a little crack on the side. So they didn't think it was roadworthy. And I don't know why he had it. I guess we were gonna face one another, but I didn't figure out why I was gonna be playing piano. I don't know why they had it, but someone had an idea it would be great for us both to have pianos. After the insurance company deemed it unroadworthy, uh, I thought maybe I can buy it, so I started inquiring to see what it was worth, and I forgot about it. And we were doing this record called Red Strikes Back at Air London. And for my uh, birthday, I got a card from Elton saying, enjoy the piano. And I still have that piano today. It's a 1928 refurbished, completely refurbished Steinway. Is it a B? Steinway B? It's Steinway O. Steinway O. A six, a six foot uh, piano, Beautiful. Hamburg model. And I've had it worked on a lot. It sounds great. And there's nothing else that plays like it, you know. It's a. It's so Elton was taking a 20s Steinway on the road for touring. It, it, it was re completely refurbished, brand new soundboard. It would right. look completely new inside. Yeah. But still, that's. Uh, yeah. 1928. That's, 1928. That's a that's a that's a heck of a piano to take on the road. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. I suppose he's serious about it. He takes serious instruments. Well, he had a Steinway out himself, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, he had a nine foot Steinway on the road, and uh, I've played the piano since. Now I think he's using Yamahas. Right. But at the time, you know, a lot of those guys, Burton, Cummings, and Freddie Mercury and all those guys were playing Steinways. And their top end was all gone because they'd been, you know, fighting with guitar players. And in order to have that, you have to be, in the early days, they were playing through guitar amps and stuff, you know, trying to get as loud as they could. And when I first, like Davey and I used to run over sometimes when we'd play Bitch or Saturday Night Live, we were both playing guitars. And we'd run over to Elton's podium and jump up where his monitors were. And we can only stay up there for about three seconds or four seconds before it became so intense we'd have to leave. First time I ever played Freddie's piano, I hit the high end and I almost went over. I, I just checked it out and went ding, and it went through my head like an ice pick. It was so loud. So whenever I played his piano, I had to turn it down. But those guys had a lot of top end missing from the years sure. of playing, you know. What electric piano was he using? At one point he was using a Roland RD-1000 when out front. But when I joined, uh, he was using a Steinway Grand. And of course, then he had monitors, proper monitors now, and he likes them a little loud. So it got a little, a little, little crazy, and I just started mixing myself. I just had them send all the stuff to me, and I had a mixer on stage, so I didn't have to keep yelling at the sound guy. I need more gu guitar, or more piano. I just had my own setup, nice stereo mix for all my keyboards, and it was great. Fantastic. Yeah, it was really, I mean, it was a perfect stereo sound when we played. I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, of course, playing those songs, how can you not like that stuff? No, incredible, and you must, I mean, in 82, the shows must have been enormous. They were pretty large. Uh, uh, 84 is when we, well, the first time we played was, uh, well, we did Wembley Arena, or Wembley Stadium, I should say. And that we did uh, as a five-piece band. It was Dee, Davey, Nigel, 
Elton and myself. And uh, I think we had 70 or 80,000 people there. So when we did Live Aid, it wasn't as foreign or, uh, you know, uh, or uh, scary as right. you'd imagine, because we'd already done that by ourselves, uh, we did a thing called a nighttime daytime concert. Oh, so you were playing with Elton on Live Aid? Yeah, Elton. I went in to tell Queen, I thought they did a great set, but when we came in, there were four little caravans you were allowed to stay in, uh, trailers, mm -hmm. and you had like, I think, 30 minutes to get ready, or 45 minutes to get ready, and 30 to get out. And it was The Who, David Bowie, Elton, and Queen. So I'd already been playing with Queen, so I went in to tell them they did a good, you know, a good set, but I'd always say that to them. There was nothing, they never did a bad set. It was not, so I had nothing to say other than, you guys were really great, you know. Like, yeah. But they always seemed to be interested in my comment, you know, because they literally wanted to know what sure. people thought. Um, well, somebody they respected, yeah. Yeah, well, I... Because fans are always going to be, you're amazing! Yeah, I, but I didn't have anything negative. This, it was hard to find anything negative with those. They were all amazing shows, you know, and it, once they, they were on a certain level, they never went below. I, I, when I was working with Aerosmith, uh, Steve and, and, and Tom told me that they toured together because they had the same manager in America. Mm -hmm. And they, he, they said that they used to always used to tease Queen because, you know, Freddie would take the boom stand off and, and they would always go, oh, you know, tease them. And then they said, secretly, we always tease them because they blow us off the stage every night. <laughs> I think that that's the sort of thing, isn't it? The, the sort of little almost sibling rivalry between Yeah, and Queen, Queen would talk about stuff. I remember when uh, Freddie was listening, he said, he was listening to something on his Walkman in those days. Mm -hmm. And he said, you gotta check this out. He'd play it, he said, yeah, I think he handed it to Brian and they handed it to me. So this is gonna be a hit. And it was every breath you take, the police, mm -hmm. you know. And they were kind of, you know, they wanted to know what was going on with the other bands and stuff. So everybody was kind of aware of what everybody else was doing. And there was a competition of sorts, you know, especially on the charts. But the weird thing was when we did I Want to Break Free uh, at the record plant, Radio Gaga, we did that here. And then they did a video for it, which was kind of take off on Coronation Street mm -hmm. and all the, you know, they dressed up as the housewives. Mm -hmm. And they had a bad reaction to that by MTV. America didn't get that joke. And of course, coming from Canada, I knew it was just sure. put on. And you know, it's Monty Python, oh, God, Benny the, Hill. The English in particular yeah. love to, you know, the British, but definitely the English, we do like to do things in drag and be silly. Drag, <laughs> look at the Rolling Stones, and uh, you know, dressed up as the RAF uh, women back in the yeah. uh, you know, album cover. So what happened was apparently they, the, they wouldn't play it on MTV. And, Which is insane, because MTV is music television. Uh, right. And they're they supposed were, to be cutting edge. They wouldn't play it here, and Queen kind of said, well, we, we're done with America. And they started concentrating on Europe and South America, and things changed for them here at that point. Of course, they had worldwide hits with both those tunes, you know. Um, but it was in what some What did ways, you play on those songs? I played uh, a lot of keyboards on Radio Gaga. Um, Roger had the, the kind of sequence stuff. Oh, okay. I played all the piano and synthesizer stuff and the bells and stuff on that. And then on Radio Gaga, on the Want to Break Free, I played the solo in the middle, which was kind of weird because... Yeah. You played that. Yeah. And I played some other... I played some... I think John had some keyboards on that as well. I think he'd done a lot of stuff on that. I thought I played more keyboards than I did on that, but I remember playing some other... I think I may have played a, a pad, kind of string pad on that as well. But the solo I didn't realize was problematic because I didn't realize I was the first guy that had ever played a solo on a Queen record other than Brian. And Brian wasn't in the studio when I did this. And by then I'd been with bands and doing records and it wasn't a big thing if someone said, oh, can you do a solo? And John said, why don't you throw a solo on here? And I didn't think anything of it. That it was a political, you know, no, no at that time. So I did the solo and I was good friends with Brian. I would not have done, want, done anything to, you know. Um, so I just did the solo and it was one take except for the last note, which I had to punch in with Mac, which went eh, a whole octave because my Jupiter 8 was set for like a whole st half step, I think, a whole tone. And I couldn't go down anywhere, anything more than eh. So when we punched it in, you know, I set it for an octave. And then I didn't think anything ab about it. And then I found out afterwards that, you know, I'd taken Brian's spot basically in a solo position. But he eventually liked the, the, the tune, I think, I liked the solo. And they, uh, yeah, I'm sure if he didn't like it, he would have replayed it. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I, I understand. I, you know, yeah. and I'm still friends with Brian today, uh, to yeah. this day, so that's a good thing. Yeah. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> He's, uh, I, I, I've, we talked about off camera. I've never met him, but he, he comes across as one as incredibly genuine. Well, 
first of all, he's a pretty bright guy, you know. <laughs> That's another step, of, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, the yes. arguments, you know, the Queen arguments backstage, you know, there was tension like any band, but sure. it wasn't like they were having dumbass arguments about, you know, sure. you sure... They would be arguing, you know, arguing about the wingspan of a butterfly or something, or <laughs> the technical, uh, you know, it was just, you know, it was a high level of problems that they were having. But, you know, they're like any family. They were very supportive and, you know, they'd argue with one another, but, you know, if somebody else criticized anybody, then it was four against one, was, you know, four sure. musketeers. It's interesting. I, I had that experience with, with, uh, with working with Aerosmith that, hmm, I can't, I'm not going to name names, but somebody came in and got involved in the dynamic, uh -huh. and then all the band members turn against that person. Yeah, well, that, that would, would have happened with Queen, too. Cause I think it's the great thing about great bands, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's the diverse personalities that help make Queen greater than the sum, you know? Absolutely. There was something that they all brought in, and like I've said before, I, I think John Deacon was a secret weapon because he wrote all these hits. You know, Another One Bites the Dust, and You're My Best Friend, and uh, I Want to Break Free. Free. Spread your wings. Yeah, and then Roger was started to, to write. He wrote Radio Gaga, which was the number one hit for his first try. Incredible song, yeah. And they all were really bright guys. And Brian himself is on Dr. Brian May, so mm -hmm. you're not dealing with a, an idiot here. I was listening to a radio program, and Brian just kind of explained the probability of alien life <laughs> using a formula that I'd never <laughs> heard before. And so it's like back in science class, and I'm listening to Dr. Brian May expa explain the universe, you know, on a casual <laughs> afternoon. And I'm going, oh, yeah, that guy, that's the same guy that, uh, you know, plays that loud guitar stuff. So I think that, uh, you know, he's a really interesting guy. And uh, they were all had their own personalities. And they're all bright guys. And I think that they just had something when they came together that was unique. Nobody else had. And F Freddie just uh, was a true artist in every way, shape, or form, from, at least from the outside. It's very interesting because when you talk about these massively successful bands, is people have such strong opinions based on the outward look. Just the other day, Brian um, put up an Instagram post and people started like going on about Freddie and all this kind of stuff. And he did actually take a stand and I, I applaud him for it. He's like, he's like, there is the outward version that people understand about people that are famous. Right. And then there is the you know, the private side that we all know about each other. And you're not thinking, oh, you're famous and I'm famous. When you're in a working situation, you're friends and you're trying to accomplish a goal. Mm -hmm. um, I think this explains Freddie's character to me. Um, he kind of, we had a mutual respect for one another's playing. He was more classically oriented and I was kind of a wild rock and roll player. But uh, there was a tune called Man on the Prowl on a record called The Works. And Freddie had played three quarters of the way through it. And he said, why don't you come in and play the rest of the tune, all that rock and roll stuff you do, and they'll think it's me, darling. <laughs> I said, they'll think it's you. Oh, okay, I'm used to doing sessions. You don't always get credit, you know? So I thought, okay. So I played this thing, and you could hear us, it splits. Not really, but you know, at a certain point, you could hear me take over and playing all this stuff, and it ends with my piano kind of doing this weird rock and roll stuff up and down the keyboard. I thought, okay, I've done it. And he gave me specific credit on the record thanks to Fred Mandel. So that indicates what kind of guy he was, you yeah. know. And I've had tea with him and hung out with him. He's not, he's not a wild guy. He was a very uh, introspective, thoughtful guy. And uh, he was, in a lot of ways, the opposite of his stage persona, you know. And people get that stuff confused. But, you know, uh, Freddie was a very intelligent guy and very thoughtful. And I thought he was a nice guy. And he was... He used to drag me out, and he brought me out to start playing Crazy Little Thing on his piano. And then after a while, he'd pick me up and take me to the front of the stage and introduce me. Though He was nothing but encouraging to me. So I have utmost respect for that guy. Um, he was a great guy. Good. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful to hear. I don't doubt any of that. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's, that's the Freddie I knew. <clears throat> so I, I don't like to hear his, his uh, reputation be smirched because the last time I saw him... Um, 1988, we were at uh, doing a record with Elton uh, at Air London, and uh, we were invited over to Queens for Thanksgiving to Roger's place. He had a condo on the Thames, and uh, I went over there. It was a whole band, and myself and Ratty, the roadie, the famous Queen roadie, and we had a good time. And then uh, Freddie wanted me to stay behind because he had just finished. Um, he wanted to play something to me, so he played me this record he'd done with Montserrat Cabier, who was a uh, 
female opera singer, famous opera singer, and he'd done a record, which I think he always wanted to do, an operatic record, you know, and he played me this thing, it was great, sang incredibly, and uh, I, I told him I thought it was amazing, you know. That was the last time I saw him, 1988. And then Mac and I went to, uh, yeah, I guess it was... Queen Mary. Queen Mary. Yep. And uh, I know of that party. Yeah, and only, I think it was uh, two guys from Queen showed up. It was Brian and maybe uh, Roger, perhaps. And two guys didn't. And I thought, something's weird, because they always came to press things, you know. So that's when I first started to suspect something was wrong. And, you know, the rest is medical history, unfortunately. But... Um, yeah, that was the last time I saw him in 1988 in person. You know, recently they released, I always liked this song that uh, we had done. We cut this record, it was basically Queen. We cut it for um, Brian's wife, Anita Dobson at the mm -hmm. time. From EastEnders, for those, from of EastEnders you, right. those of you who remember that show. And I always kept saying to Brian throughout the years, that song is a great song, you should, you should cut it again, do a, release it or something. And, and he put Freddie on it, they, they cut it with Freddie's vocal and at the track that we originally did. And they released it a few years ago, and I think it's 2014. It's uh, called Let Me In Your Heart Again. And it's just myself playing piano with uh, Roger and John and Brian. And then Freddie put this, which I think is one of his best vocals on this track. It's very raw. Uh, there's not a lot of stuff going on. Brian's tripled guitars, but it's still a raw Queen track. And they released it on the um, Queen Forever uh, LP a few years ago. So I'm really proud of that, and I think his vocal is just amazing. It's, uh, I didn't, I hadn't heard it because we cut it, you know, in the studio just with the four of us. But uh, it's certainly worth checking that out. I'm still flabbergasted I didn't know that you played the solo on I Want to Break Free. Oh, really? That's pretty, that's pretty huge. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, the weird thing about it is when you do a solo. Because I used to mimic that on guitar oh, in, a, in a covers band in the 80s, yeah, when I was a little kid. Well, it comes out of a guitar concept. Yeah. Because yeah. I usually, always used to like guitar solos on synthesizers. Mm -hmm. I liked Jan Hammer and all that stuff. Sure. And I always used to think guitar because it made sense to me, you know, because you're bending notes. And, I, you know, I guess I wanted to play my keyboards like a guitar player a lot. And that's where it comes out of that. And I only played it once. I, can, I doubt if I could play it again today. And if you look on YouTube, there's millions of guys trying to play that solo and ver versions of it. So right. I didn't realize that it had become... Uh, a big solo, but apparently it was, so, <laughs> you know. But like I say, you know, it's a one-take one, one take thing. It was one take with a punch, and that was it. And then Bob's your uncle, and on you go. That's amazing. Yeah, it was fun. But apparently that tune was uh, big in South Africa when they were having the uh, Nelson Mandela period. It was wonderful to hear. Yeah, I wasn't unaware of that. So uh, you just don't hear all that stuff in the States anymore. I mean, it was worldwide, but I, it wasn't as prominent in the States, I don't think. Well, luckily now, because of the movie, yeah. um, it's... But what's interesting to mention, um, before the movie came out, uh, Queen was still pretty much the biggest legacy artist in the world. If you go into Spotify, there was, I think it was a point they were like number 75 in the world of every artist on right. Spotify. Uh -huh. I think, um, as we're pointing out, the rest of the world, they've always been so huge, you know. That's true. Regardless uh, of their success up and down in America. I mean, you look at, I mean, you, you obviously know. That's why I was asking you about the shows in South America, because they broke record attendances there. 300,000 and people like that. Yeah, you know, it was so people, paid uh, people everywhere. Yeah. You know, I didn't know as much about them when I joined them. I was a much bigger fan coming out of the band than I, than I knew. Uh, it was so weird the way I was hired for Queen. I, I don't know who gave me the recommendation, but I went to meet Jerry Stickles, who was their road manager who I never knew was Jimi Hendrix's road manager from beginning to end. I didn't know through the whole, he never mentioned it. So I went and I met him in LA here and we talked for a few minutes and he said, okay, you'll do. I said, don't you want to hear me play? He said, no, I know you can play. I just want to make sure you can get along with the band. Nice. So I flew to Montreal on Sunday night and we rehearsed Monday and Tuesday and I played with him Wednesday night <laughs> on a bunch of complicated stuff. I don't know, I couldn't do that today. I mean, it's like, you know, Mission Impossible and I don't know how I learned all those tunes. I had to learn a synthesizer in a week that I'd never used before and, and a, bun a bunch of tunes. Same thing happened with Elton. I went to Australia, I uh, got the gig, so we, we start off in Australia. I have 44 tunes I need to learn. We have one three hour rehearsal. <laughs> he then decides to get married and that's it. <laughs> the next thing I know I'm on stage playing Someone Save My Life Tonight and you know all this complicated stuff that I learned on a little Casio in my, you know, my, my hotel room. 
And I just sat there and worked on tunes. Next thing I know, I didn't know we were going to call off all the rehearsals, but anyway, it worked out in the long run. <laughs> <laughs> kind of crazy. I could not have done that again today if I thought about it, you know. But at the time, uh, at the time I was stupider. <laughs> well, I mean, you were so in it. You were in the music. When yeah. you're in that place, um, I, I, I fully relate. When, when that's all you're living and eating and breathing. Well, it wasn't like I could coast because we were doing the stuff off of uh, Hot Space. Mm -hmm. So John was not playing bass on a lot of that stuff. He's playing rhythm guitar. So mm -hmm. guess who was playing bass? I was. And you know, you can fool around a lot of instruments, but you can't stop playing bass. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can, and it was fast. And there was not symmetrical tunes. There was A and B did not always return. Mm -hmm. They went to C and then back to possibly B or half of B. It was like, I don't know how we did it, but we, we got it all done. And uh, we had a success. It wasn't uh, six, four, one, five the whole time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just crazy stuff. And it worked, it all worked out. And, uh, you know, by the time I think we, I think we did Japan first or, or America, I can't remember the order of those tours, but we had the tunes down by the time we got to, to play them, obviously, but uh, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed playing with those guys. It was great, great experience. And it was always exciting. And, and there was never any lack of guitar on stage. You could always hear the guitar, but it was such a huge sound. It was really inspiring. You know, it's a giant sound on stage and the vocals with Freddie singing, you know, it's incredible. And Roger, great drummer, underrated drummer, I think, an amazing drummer. And so was John Deacon. I, I was really surprised at some of the guitar lines, the bass lines, you know, he'd play and the guitar stuff he did on rhythm. He was really a great musician and the four of them together was just like a powerhouse. So, uh, you know, I was really proud to be part of that. Thing. I was, when I went to, I never saw them with Freddie. Um, I think at that period of my life, I was an up and coming struggling musician myself and I didn't have any money to buy expensive tickets and go to big shows. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, they were well past club gigs in the 80s. Right. So, um, but I did, you know, I have seen them subsequently. I saw them with Adam just last year, for instance. And it's still basically a four piece. It is. Well, I, it's I, insane how much sound comes out. And you're like, there's so many songs where there's not even a piano going. It's just guitar, bass and drums. Right. And I do have to give a shout out to Spike Edney because he took over from what I did. Um, and he has done a remarkable job of, of the keyboard stuff that, you know, he, he put together all the, the Radio Gaga stuff that we did, which was layered and complex. And uh, he's got that all together when, he, when it comes in. It sounds great. And, he, and Spike was playing with him from 84, 85 on. He did a great job and is, still continues to do a great job with those guys. So I have to give him a, a shout out because that guy really is holding together the keyboard uh, end of that band. Reproducing all the stuff that we did live is tough, you know. It's amazing. Yeah. I just, I just marveled at uh, Brian plays, plays rhythm and then, boom, you know, goes into the solo part and then back to rhythm. There's no, it's there's so, nobody covering it when he's, it's just a band. You're right. It, it basically is a trio. Yeah. It's a trio. Yeah. I tell you the truth, I always wondered how are they going to cover that stuff vocally live because they were known for 90, 92 tracks or vocals and Roy was telling me about this stuff. They do it because Roger is also a secret weapon there with the high parts. Mm -hmm. He sings all that top stuff and it's pretty thick with, with the three of them harmonizing. It gets pretty thick. I love I loved that they re... They dug up the smile stuff because then yeah. you hear them harmonizing behind a different singer and you're like, wow, these guys can sing. Yeah, they can all sing. Yeah. I mean, they're all, they're all solo singers. I mean, they've all done solo records. Roger, Roger can sing all the high stuff mm -hmm. and he's a rock and roll singer and so can Brian. I've seen, I saw Brian's solo tour. He was playing L.A., went down, caught that. And, I mean, he sings great live. So there was no shortage of... You know, and it was good harmony, all in tune, in time, and you know, they they had that thing happening, you know. And the, as a power trio, man, you know, that, that Brian had something special going on as a guitar player. He's a special player. And he's an orchestral arranger. If you listen to the stuff he's done where he's mimicking clarinets and stuff in the mm -hmm. early, you know, I mean, there's something way more than just, you know, you know, going down on that guitar. He's got, he's got that, but he also has a whole other uh, sensibility involved, you know. You forget what a brilliant player he is, you know, because you take it for granted. You heard that when, when it first came out, nobody heard anything like that. The tripled guitar parts, and, and he duplicates that live with the uh, delay, you mm -hmm. know, so he's able to play on top of his own stuff. But, but as an arranger, he's responsible for a lot of that stuff with Queen. 
Amazing. Yeah. Fred, thank you ever so much. My I'm, pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you. Thanks for telling us about your career. Um, thanks for uh, indulging me in, in some Queen moments. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, it's great. I, I watch your stuff anyway, so it's just happy to add to the collection. <laughs> It's fantastic. It's wonderful having you here. Nice to be here, man. We'll definitely put, um, there'll be a link. There'll be a blog, of course. We'll have, you know, some more in-depth stuff we're talking about. We'll also link to all of the stuff that Fred was talking about in his own career as well, outside of just playing with Queen. Um, but I will definitely have a Spotify link to the I Want to Break Free. Oh, I'm, great. Yeah, because cool. that's a heck of a solo. It's fun solo. <laughs> Thanks ever so much. A one take. With a punch. With one, one take with a punch. And it was a Jupiter 8. Reminds me of my old girlfriend, but that's another story. <laughs> that's another story. Uh, yeah, Jupiter 8. That is quite outstanding because that is, was literally my favorite synth. I love that synth. Yeah, it was a great synth. I will add, well, I'll add you something. I'll no. tell you something afterwards. So that'll, um, I went, tell me, tell uh, well, me. Okay, I, I, I had done that solo. Yeah. And I was in London a few years later after the record came out. And I was uh, looking at a Roland synthesizer, and it had maze sound on that. On a, it said maze sound. You know one of those names yeah. they call with the yeah. sound? And I played it, and it was wah, wah. It was a, the sound of my synthesizer. So Roland thought that it had been done by Brian May on a guitar, and they duplicated it. It was really done in a Roland synth, and they duplicated that sound onto another synthesizer, which was really, really their own Jupiter 8. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so I thought, yeah. But you tweaked the sound, presumably. You created your own sound on it. That yeah. wasn't a preset. It was a preset. It yeah. was a preset. It was a preset on it that they were using to sell another synthesizer. Oh, no, but the sound, the original sound you created the by... The original, I, yeah, I, I tweaked on the Roland Jupiter 8, which I really like because it, you know... That's but that's kind of one of those crazy stories, which doesn't mean anything, really. <laughs> <laughs> Marvis, thank you ever so much. Um, please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Thank you ever so much for watching, and have a marvellous time recording and mixing and playing.